Welcome to the last uh, seminar of the year, actually. Okay. And we have uh, Sean Wei Fan here. He's from Stanford University. Uh, he's a physicist by training, but he's in the electrical engineering department at Stanford. And I think he's, but he's not in the main building for electrical engineering. He's sort of yeah. in with the applied physics people. Uh, he did his PhD at MIT. In 1997, uh, did a postdoc, was a research associate there, and then came to Stanford in 2001, I think, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and he's a full professor at Stanford now, and he's going to talk to us about uh, something in photonic crystal structures. I'm sure he's going to explain the first line. All right, so, uh, so I'll start. Um, so, uh, and it's, uh, thanks, Glenn, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm from the Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford. And uh, uh, so this is, I'm really going to be talking about the work of uh, two of my uh, really outstanding students and postdocs, Ke Jie Fang and Zhongfu Yu. And part of the experimental collaboration is uh, with uh, Professor Nihal Lipson's group in uh, Cornell University. So um, as a brief background of my group, I guess, uh, we broadly look into the application of something called nanophotonic structures. And these are structures that are as single or deep subwave lens, lens scale for most of the cases. So on the left here is a uh, photonic crystal structure made by uh, my colleague uh, Jim Harris. So uh, what you see here uh, is a piece of silicon. Uh, this is a top view of a silicon structure. Uh, it's a silicon on silicon dioxide. The thickness of the silicon is about uh, a couple hundred nanometers. And then one put in a periodic array of holes uh, with the periodicity here to be about three to four hundred nanometers or so. So uh, these are structures that are, uh, we developed it, this particular structure uh, to do slow light, uh, slow, down the, slow down the propagation of a pulse uh, inside a silicon structure. So uh, on the right, what you see is a, a plasmonic structure made by uh, my student, Levin Maslagers. And this is a probably about 100 nanometers thick uh, silver film. And then with an aperiodic array of slits uh, introduced into it, made by a focus beam uh, lithography, focus beam uh, fo uh, by FIB etching. And the uh, narrowest slits here is on the order of 30 nanometers or so. And this we actually have made it into a lens uh, for focusing light uh, in uh, image sensors. So. Uh, so I, uh, we generally are quite interested uh, in these classes of structure for control of electromagnetic wave. And we look at these structures for a variety of different applications, uh, including information technology, in, uh, and also in energy applications such as solar cell, and also control of thermal radiation. Uh, in this talk, uh, I'm going to be focusing on one very specific application uh, of these kind of structures and ideas. And that has to do with the, uh, uh, some application in the information technology. And in particular, uh, in a device called isolator. So uh, part of my talk is actually going to be very practically driven. Um, so uh, we all know, of course, that information is carried in large-scale optical information network based on fiber. And if you look at a fiber network, and you look at the diagram of it, there usually is a uh, device called an isolator. And this is a device that allows light to propagate in one direction, but prohibit any light from coming backward. So yeah, it's a one-way propagation of light. Light can go forward, but cannot come back. And has been very widely used in uh, fiber network uh, because it prevent coherent back and forth between different devices, so you get rid of reflection. And as it does that, it improves the stability and the scalability of the, uh, of the systems. In these days, uh, there has been a lot of interest in both in research and industry in trying to scale communication network, which traditionally occurs, occur at a global scale, down to a single computer chip to improve the communication bandwidth inside a computer chip. So in do so, what one is trying to do is essentially construct a network that look like this, information network look like this, but down to a single computer chip. And in doing so then, it will be very important to miniaturize 
most of these components down to a single computer chip level. An isolator, therefore, it will be very important to, for example, miniaturize isolator from its bulk form into a on-chip device. So isolator turned out to be a very unusual device. So this is how a commercial uh, optical isolator looks like. This is something that you can plug a fiber into. And uh, uh, it typically uses magneto-optical material. And one of the very important things about optical isolator is, in fact, it is what's called non-reciprocal, or a physics term, it breaks time reversal symmetry. So uh, here is typically how an isolator works. Uh, you, if you have a material with a built-in macroscopic magnetization, then uh, light that's propagating along the magnetization, if it's linearly polarized in, will get rotated uh, by a certain amount. Now, to see this device is non-reciprocal, uh, what you need to do is to take the outgoing wave and you do a time reversal operation, so you keep the linear polarization, but you flip the rotation direction, uh, flip the propagation direction, and then you send back into the same structure. This being a non-reciprocal device simply means that the polarization, after it passing back the same structure, does not go back to the original state, but instead has pointing somewhere else. So once you have that, then you can build filter to distinguish forward and backward direction. So uh, now one of the basic difficulty in trying to integrate these kind of devices onto, let's say, a silicon uh, computing platform or silicon integrated circuit platform uh, is the fact that, in fact, these materials that has non-reciprocal effects are typically very unusual materials, things like itron iron garnet, <coughs> that you don't usually find in standard electronics or standard optoelectronics. And on the other hand, most of the standard optoelectronic material, silicon, garden arsenide, and so on, do not have magneto-optical effect. So uh, therefore, it would be very interesting to figure out a way to do non-reciprocal optics on chip using standard uh, auto auto electronic materials such as silicon. Now, to do <coughs> non-reciprocal optics, it would be uh, somewhat useful, I think, to briefly reply, uh, to briefly review um, Lorentz reciprocity theorem, which underlies this. I'm not going to go through the full form of it, but simply by emphasizing that uh, this is a theorem that apply to a very wide variety of electromagnetic uh, materials, uh, as long as they are linear, they are time independent, means that its property do not change as a function of time, and also has a symmetric epsilon or mu, and a symmetric, therefore, symmetric permittivity and permeability tensor. And that includes mediums that have gain and loss. So as a result, the list of media that satisfies Lorentz reciprocity theorem include most of the standard optoelectronic materials. And one very important consequence of Lorentz uh, reciprocity theorem is that if you build a device out of these materials, then its symmetric, its uh, scattering matrix has to be symmetric. So uh, by scattering matrix, basically these are the, trans uh, the transmission and reflection coefficient. So uh, imagine that you build a device that has three ports coming in and out then the uh, scattering matrix, basically the transmission reflection coefficient, for example, uh, S13 here, basically is taking a wave that coming from the third port and measure its transmission coefficient coming out of the first port. And S31 is taking the transmission coming from the first port and coming out in the third port. Now, uh, reciprocity theorem implies that this scattering matrix must be symmetrical. In other words, uh, these two processes, a transmission going this way and a transmission that's coming backward, in, must be equal in its transmission coefficient in both amplitude and phase. So there is no way that you can distinguish between these two directions. So one of the very important consequences is that any of the materials satisfying Lorentz reciprocity theorem cannot distinguish forward and backward, and therefore, uh, cannot be used as an isolator. Now this, of course, is a very, very old theorem. It's more than 100 years old. And uh, so uh, it turned out also have some subtleties. And if you forget, 
uh, you will get interesting results. So um, uh, just as sort of a quiz, uh, I'll present one of the examples, uh, just to confuse you a little bit. So uh, over the years, there have always been people who have been trying to construct an isolator uh, using things like silicon. And here's one example. Uh, I like it because it's my own. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a photonic crystal structure I mentioned briefly. Uh, the black dots here are silicon rods. Okay? And so what you see here is basically a periodic array of uh, silicon rods that makes a waveguide. So this is a place where you don't have any rods. And so, uh, and then uh, we use fancy algorithm to design uh, a particular arrangement at the center here that looks somewhat like an S, uh, but in any case. Um, so uh, with this arrangement, the device does something interesting. Uh, if you send light from the left, you can see very high transmission. Okay? Whereas if you take the same light and send it from the right, you can see nothing goes through. So uh, that's certainly, I think, a quite an interesting device. Now, uh, the question is, well, can you use this as an isolator? This is certainly a device that distinguishes between forward and backward direction. Now, if you think a little bit about it, you will realize, of course, the answer is no. And the important point about this is that to test non-reciprocity, you will need to take the light that's coming out time reverse it and send it backward. Okay. Now, clearly, what you see here is a device that takes the fundamental even mode and convert almost completely into an odd mode. So the device being reciprocal means that if you were to send not the fundamental even mode from the right, but send the odd mode from the right, then it will go through perfectly. And that's, of course, what you see. So in other words, in a reciprocal device, Having a high transmission channel in the forward direction necessarily imply having a high transmission channel in the backward direction. And therefore, you cannot use this as an isolator for a practical reason that isolator was put in to cancel reflection from any different modal content. Reflection is considered to be noise, and therefore, you cannot a priori assume anything about the kind of reflection that you're going to get. So as a result, you could never use these kind of structure actually to construct an isolator. So uh, this is my example, but I think in the literature there has been a very large number of papers that try to construct these isolators uh, in such a way which is of course incorrect. And for a more sophisticated example, you can take a look at the comment that I wrote uh, this year in Science about somebody else's uh, fake isolator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to reiterate, um, I think that uh, one of the important message here is that to test non-reciprocity or to test time reversal symmetry breaking, you would need to time reverse the output mode back in. And I think that's the one of the very important message uh, to do. And also, the reciprocity actually says the Lorentz reciprocity theorem actually says that there are not that many choices to do an isolator. If you insist on doing a linear device that's time independent, the only choice is known is the magneto-optical effects uh, or its variance. But basically, the only way you can get uh, time reversal symmetry breaking for light in a static linear structure involves using asymmetric permittivity or permeability tensors. There are no other ways of doing so. And so if you do not like magneto optics, as most of the integrated photonics people don't, uh, then um, there are only a few choices that are available. One of them is to say, well, let's get rid of the linearity and do a nonlinear effect. There have been a significant number of work along that direction. One of the difficulty, of course, is that nonlinear effects is nonlinear. And therefore, isolation occur only within the power range, which is undesirable. So instead, what we do is an alternative approach that's to look instead into time-dependent system. For example, a modulator. These are devices where the dielectric constant actually varies as a function of time. Now, 
using modulator uh, to break reciprocity or break time reversal symmetry is in fact very well known. Uh, in commercial fiber gyroscope, uh, there are modulators put in specifically for that purposes. But what we would like to do, and that's the question that we try to answer, is how to turn those time reversal symmetry breaking into a way so that you can actually get complete optical isolation. So, the, uh, so what we're going to show uh, in this talk is in fact you can do so, and all you need is to specifically design and configure a silicon waveguide, and then you modulate the dielectric function of the waveguide in a very specific way. So the underlying microscopic mechanism is something we call photonic transition by dynamic refractive uh, index modulation. The idea of a, a photonic transition is a pretty old one, and this uh, and his initial paper uh, was done by uh, my thesis advisor, uh, Professor John Janopoulos, more than a decade ago. Uh, what he envisioned is you take a photonic crystal, and therefore you have a band structure uh, frequency as a function wave vector for this periodic structure. Now, uh, you can then perturb this photonic <coughs> crystal by modulating its dielectric function as a function of space and time. And as you do that, uh, the modulation having a particular frequency and a particular wave vector can couple different states together. So for example, if you choose it to be this particular frequency and wave vector, you couple with these two states together. And therefore, if you start a system in one of the states, it's going to go to that state and come back. So this, in a way, is like transition occur in the electronic system, uh, but of course, it involves photons, and therefore, the name uh, photonic transition. Now, of course, you don't have to do this in a uh, photonic crystal. You can have a more simple structure. And so, uh, for example, you can take a, a silicon waveguide and that having two modes, a fundamental even mode and a uh, first order odd mode. In the band diagram, this will be frequency as a function of wave vector. So you have these two curves that basically are the dispersion relation of these modes. And for two of the modes on the dispersion curve, you can couple them together by modulating the waveguide. So uh, what you do is you basically imagine in the gray region here in the waveguide, you modulate the dielectric function in this particular form with a frequency and a wave vector. And if you chose the frequency and wave vector right, you can phase match and couple these two modes together. So consequently, if you send in one of these states, it's going to convert to the other state. And that's uh, what you see in a finite difference time domain simulation. So you send in a fundamental even mode at frequency omega 1. It propagates along the waveguide until you enter into this area where it's been modulated, in which case you, of course, get a very complicated pattern. But if you choose the modulated area lens right, then upon coming out of it, it gets converted into the first order art mode with a slightly different frequency. So by modulating in this form, therefore, you can couple two states of the systems together. One of the very unusual things, however, about this modulation is that it breaks time reversal symmetry. And you can do that by simply staring at this uh, modulation form for a while and realize that if you revert the direction of time, if you do a transformation where you do t to minus t, you are going to change the modulation form. So the modulation is not time reversal invariant. Similarly, it also does not have spatial inversion symmetry. Reverting the sign of the spatial coordinate z here also changed the modulation form. So as a result, this is a modulation that simultaneously breaks both time reversal and spatial inversion symmetry. And that's important because to get an isolator, you can very easily convince yourself that you need to break both of them. And in this particular case, therefore, what you see is that this modulation, while phase match two modes in the forward direction, actually does not phase match any pair of modes in the backward direction. So as a result, when you look at the simulation, you get this. So I already show you the first panel here. If you send in frequency omega 1 at a fundamental even mode, upon passing through the structure, they convert. Now to see that this is non-reciprocal, what you do is you take this mode that's coming out, do a time reversal operation, which means preserve the modal shape, and flip the propagation direction. So you send it back into the same 
structure that's being modulated in time. And what you see, of course, it doesn't convert at all, but remain in the original mode. Similarly, if you send in a even mode uh, at omega 1, it also does not convert. So the contrast between the first and the middle panel here is a direct indication that you have high reversal symmetry breaking or have non contrasty <coughs> in this system. So once you have that, you can build isolators. And uh, uh, now let me just very quickly comment on a few aspects of this scheme that's actually of practical importance. Uh, the first one is that it is well known that in electro-optic modulation, what you can practically get in modulation frequency uh, is relatively low on the order of a few gigahertz or tens of gigahertz. And the interesting thing here is that with that kind of modulation frequency, uh, you could actually get very broadband over terahertz bandwidth conversion between the modes because all you would need uh, is to design two parallel bands so that uh, it's like in the electronic transition having parallel bands. In this case, you, in the photonic transition, you have two bands that are essentially parallel. Yes? So back one slide, if you reverse the phase of omega-2... Yeah. It does not matter. No, no phase is going to... No phase. Omega. It's a linear device. Okay. It's a, yeah, that's a very important point. It's a linear device. Um, therefore, the phase does not enter. So, uh, but that's uh, one point is that it can be a very broad band device. The second is precisely the point that we're making here. Uh, this is a purely linear device as far as the instant wave is concerned. And uh, uh, therefore, the response of the device does not depend on the amplitude or the phase of the light that you send in. And that's crucial from a isolator perspective uh, because uh, Isolator in the end need to be a device that are independent of anything that you send in the backward direction and that include amplitude, phase, or any other or data format or power shape. And only a linear device in principle can allow you to do that. So I've shown you that you could get non reciprocity out of these kind of structures. Next, what I'm going to show you is that using this kind of scheme, you could actually completely reproduce most of the standard, almost all the standard magneto-optical devices in this way. But, so, but you didn't finish saying the ease of modulating. Sorry? You didn't finish the description of the ease of modulation. I mean, you have to not only get the frequency right, but you oh, have I'm to get the wave. Oh, I'm going to show an experimental example. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean... Yeah. I'm going to show an uh, it's not obvious that you can modulate. Uh, you, yeah, it's not obvious at all, but you could, but the thing... You're going to see. Okay, yeah. So, uh, but I'm going to show an example that you could actually completely reproduce a magneto optical functionality, which is something called a circulator. So, uh, if you may recall, what we do is we take a waveguide and modulate it. Now, uh, if you imagine that you have a fairly long waveguide and you send in omega 1, then of course, uh, having two more beat against each other, they're going to oscillate back and forth. So as wave propagate, you will start omega 1, convert into omega 2 of a higher order odd mode, and convert it back. So what I showed you here just now was a case where we choose the lens of the modulator region to be what we call a coherence lens, but essentially it's a lens where you have a complete conversion. Instead of doing so, you could have a device with two coherence lines, in which case the, uh, the forward going light will convert and then convert it back. So in this case, in the forward direction, you start with a fundamental even mode, at omega 1. You convert and then convert it back into com fundamental even mode with omega 1. In the backward direction, you start with a fundamental mode, omega 1. It doesn't do anything, so it propagates right through. So in this case, in the forward and backward direction, as far as the input and output is concerned, uh, the modal shape and the frequency are all the same. Omega 1 in, omega 1 out in the fundamental even mode. But the photon really have gone through two different physical pathways. In one case, <coughs> it converted. In the other one, it doesn't. So as a result, what distinguishes the forward and backward direction is a different phase. 
So the result is that if you choose the lens to be twice the coherence lens, you get a device that generates a non-reciprocal phase shift. The forward and backward actually happen to have a phase that's different. And that phase fortuitously turned out to be pi. So once you have that phase, you can construct an uh, interferometer. You can imagine a two-arm interferometer, uh, a forward-going light, in passing through this two-arm interferometer because of the phase that's going in here, will show up in pole three. Whereas a backward-going light, because of the non-reciprocity in the phase shift in the upper arm, will actually show up in pole two. So in this case, what you get is a four-port circulator. Light come in, come out here, and the injected light come out here. And that's a standard magneto-optical device. And the response function of this device is identical to a standard magneto-optical circulator. If you put this thing in a black box, you will not be able to tell by input-output relation whether the system has magneto-optical device in there or not. So um, I've shown you at least theoretically how you can go about constructing an isolator this way. Now, uh, how do you do that experimentally? Uh, there are actually many ways to do so. And one of the ways, which I'm not going to go into great detail, uh, is to use acoustic optical effect. So the modulation in this case uh, is provided by acoustic wave, and uh, which to provide the right kind of frequency shift and the wave vector shift. And there has been experiment uh, uh, occurred uh, demonstrating a fairly narrow band isolator uh, inside a photonic crystal fiber. And uh, we have also done theory showing how you can take the same scheme but make it into a very broad band isolator by tailoring the transition a little bit. But what I'd like to show here is really an experiment where we did on a silicon chip. So, uh, and this is the work that we did with uh, Michal Lipson's group at Cornell. Uh, who has constructed a modulator specifically to achieve non-reciprocity. So in silicon, you can inject <coughs> carriers or take out carrier from silicon. And as you do that, uh, it's going to modulate the refractive index of silicon a little bit due to the plasma dispersion of the free carrier. And that's actually the physical mechanism for a large number of commercial silicon electro-optic modulators. So uh, what she did here is to construct a specific one of a silicon-based electro-optic modulator to function as a non-reciprocal device. So the optical part of her device uh, is essentially a waveguide in through a multimode interference filter coupled into a two-mode waveguide. These two-mode waveguides then, uh, then undergoes electro-optic modulation. So as a result, a even mode in in the forward direction coupled the even mode of the two-mode waveguide Without going through the transition, it becomes still the even mode and has a high transmission efficiency. Whereas in the backward direction, fundamental mode in, coupled to the even <coughs> mode, propagate, become an odd mode, and at the end, radiates away. So in doing so, one can have a, a forward and backward intensity contrast between two single mode waveguides, which is a clear indication of the presence of that reciprocity in this device. So that's the uh, optical part. On the uh, electronic part, uh, what she did is she put PN junction along cross-section of the waveguide. And she individually controlled the phase of these PN junction that's being modulated. So the device consists, uh, the device consists of silicon waveguide that's one centimeter long and having 88 <coughs> different sections that are being modulated. And the phase of the section are then controlled. So uh, from this, uh, here is the experimental result. So, um, first of all, the device in the absence of electrical input should be reciprocal. This device, if you don't put any electromodulation, should not be able to distinguish forward and backward direction. So the first step experiment is actually to measure the transmission uh, spectrum in the forward and backward direction in the absence of electrical input and then take the ratio of them. So if you take the ratio of them, it's actually unity here. And that's an indication that the experiment, at least the setup, is correct. You respect the fundamental feathers about, reciprocal, about reciprocity. Now, once you establish that baseline, then you can drive it with electrical input. And as you drive it, you start to develop a frequency range where there's a contrast between the forward and backward direction. 
And this is a device that's being modulated at 20 gigahertz, but the frequency range where you have contrast uh, already can be as large as hundreds of gigahertz. And that's one experimental indication that you could actually get broadband non-reciprocity out of relatively low frequency modulation. So now, as one would say, so I think what I've shown you here is that clearly you could actually get non-reciprocal devices by modulating a silicon waveguide structure. Now, uh, as someone would say, this is an incredibly complicated device. You are talking about a waveguide uh, with large number of modulators, each required to be individually controlled. Easier way that one can simplify these kind of devices into a more manageable form. And so to do that, actually get to the second part of my talk regarding a gauge field and a gauge potential for photons. So uh, as you can see here, what we're doing here is to try to break time reversal symmetry for photons. And in our case, we do it with uh, a modulation. So we modulate the refractive index at function of time. Now, if you go back to the electronic world, that's not what you typically do. Instead, in the electronic world, of course, what you do is you apply a static magnetic field. So on the face of it, these two schemes, these two ideas are completely different than they are. But the question is, is there any connection between them? And it turned out there is a very strong connection that both are actually governed by the principle of gauge transformation. So uh, to illustrate that, we again come back, first of all, very quickly review how the gauge potential enter in quantum mechanics for electrons. So it is well known that in quantum mechanics, uh, electron doesn't couple to magnetic field, it couples to the gauge potential. And what the gauge potential does is it induces a transformation in the electron wave function. And one simple way to present the effect of gauge potential is in the path integral formula. So imagine that you have an electron propagate from point one to point two uh, in a particular pathway. So it's one of the paths that you're going to sum over in the five minus of path integral formalism. Now, uh, there is a propagation phase that's going to be present in the absence of the gauge potential. And also, if you have the gauge potential, there is an additional phase that come out of the line integral of the gauge potential along the propagation pathway. And uh, the, the reciprocal part, of course, does not depend on which direction you propagate. On the other hand, the phase that comes out of the gauge potential does depend on the direction. It's a path integral, and this is a line we go from 1 to 2. So if you go from integral from 2 to 1, you flip the sign. So uh, what you see here, what enter, how the gauge potential enter for electron is this phase factor. For, the, uh, for a given pathway, and it's direction dependent, as I mentioned. Also, it's ambiguous. There are a very large gauge degree of freedom that you can choose that does not affect the underlying physics. As a result, this phase in itself is not observable. On the other hand, the phase difference between two different pathways, or the phase that you accumulate out of a round trip, is detectable. And the, the device that detects that is the AB interferometer. So now, this gauge potential is typically associated with charge. By seeing how the gauge potential actually enter in here, it's very interesting to ask whether you can do similar things for photons. And so uh, what I'm going to show you is a rest of people doing so. So again, we go back to photonic transition. I take my waveguide and modulate it. But to simplify things further, I'm going to modulate it in a spatially independent way so there's no longer a z-dependency. So this is a pure temporal modulation. In this case, of course, it drives a direct transition between two modes at the same wave vector. Now, uh, if you start with a fundamental even mode at time equal to zero, as uh, you drive it, it's going to go to the uh, excited state and come back. And so you see the sinusoidal oscillation, as I've shown you a number of times. Now, one interesting point that you notice is that when I wrote the modulation in this form, I did not put a phase in here. 
And I don't do that because it does not matter. And you can see that this being a steady state situation, you can shift the origin, time origin of the modulation, and that will automatically add a phase factor inside the modulation form. The detail of physics should never depend on the origin of time. And so this uh, changing a modulation phase in this way should not affect the underlying physics. You should get the same physics. So if you want to see a demonstration, you can take the same structure. Now you modulate it by putting a phase factor here. And it will the, the state will still oscillate between these two configurations and within exactly the same pattern. So this phase by itself actually does not affect the underlying physics of the system. So now what you see here is in fact a degree of freedom inside the microscopic physics that does not change what you observe. And that's precisely the definition of a gauge degree of freedom if you read these days quantum field theory book. So if you want to go a step deeper into it, you can take this two-level system and write down the Hamiltonian and write down the state. So you decompose the state of the system into a linear superposition uh, in the basis of this even and odd mode. And then you can write down the time evolution for the amplitude of it. So you get a two-by-two two Hamiltonian for this time evolution operator. And uh, the phase, the modulation phase here shows up in the off-diagonal matrix element of the Hamiltonian mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in precisely in this way. So the phase actually shows up as a phase factor in the off-diagonal matrix element. So what this says is that the upward transition and the downward transition here acquire different phase. And that phase factor is your modulation phase. So uh, as I mentioned, in a single two-state system, this degree of freedom is completely irrelevant. Changing the time origin of it, we simply can move this number in any way you want to, and it doesn't enter into a detailed time evolution of the system. But it is there, and the gauge degree of freedom, you can detect it. And you can detect it basically by having two of these two-state systems and couple them together. So as a result, imagine that you start from state one. If you go through a clockwise pathway, you go up here, propagate, go down here, propagate back into the same state. So you go up here and go down here. On the other hand, in the time-reversed trajectory, you can propagate to here, go up, propagate back, and go down. In this case, you go up here and go down here. So you can see that, in this case, because the phase difference of the upward and downward transition, <coughs> these two time reversally connected pathways start to acquire different phases. And, so a, and what you see here is basically a phase difference between two time reversal rela related trajectory due to a gauge degree of freedom. And having this and being able to detect this phase difference is then a uh, is precisely a AB interferometer. So as a uh, physical implementation, what you can do is to take two silicon waveguide, two sections of it, and you modulate the silicon waveguide in a specific way so that on one section of it you modulate in here, uh, again in a spatial uniform way, and in other section you modulate it, but you put in additional pi over two difference. And as you do that. You can see, again, this non-reciprocal modal conversion, a fundamental mode even here coming and show up in here, and there's no modal conversion in the backward direction. So, uh, and in this case, therefore, what we have shown is that if you can build silicon modulator, then only two modulators controlled at different phases are sufficient to give you basically an AB interferometer and therefore give you an isolator. So uh, this is a uh, theory that uh, uh, my student uh, Ke Jiefang did uh, earlier this year. Uh, myself being a theorist, of course, I always thought being able to do theory is challenging enough. Uh, but um, 
uh, apparently that's not so for some of my students. And so uh, after he did the theory, he then went and constructed an experiment. We don't have the capability of doing silicon modulator, so instead what we did uh, is we did a radio wave experiment. So he went and buy uh, all sorts of components and put it together. And so uh, the, uh, this experiment is carried out in around uh, 8 to 12 megahertz. So uh, the components here is a two-arm interferometer. So the components here are uh, filters and mixers on one arm to give you the non-reciprocal phase shift. And the, on the other arm is a phase shifter. And here is a uh, actual picture of the, uh, of the, of the construction. Uh, basically, uh, you can see, I think the mixer, which is the important ones, are uh, here and there. That's being driven by uh, vector network analysis. So underlying it, this is how the device actually works. Uh, here, the photonic transition is simulated by having the mixer. So if you send a signal omega coming from the left, in the upper arm, passing through the first filter, it doesn't do anything. Upon passing through the first filter, the filter, the first mixer, excuse me, the mixer basically take a local oscillator, mix it with this frequency to generate sidebands at a plus and minus omega. Then you pass through a filter to remove the one of the uh, frequency components. You get a pure frequency component, omega plus omega. Then you <coughs> pass through the second mixer, which again beats them to generate omega and omega plus two omega. You put in the second filter, get rid of the two omega component, then you get omega that coming out here. Okay. So the, the thing is that in the first mixer here, it go up in frequency, and in the second mixer here, it goes down in frequency. Now, in the time reverse trajectory, you go through exactly the same thing. You have frequency passing through the first mixer, have two frequencies, filter one of them out. Passing through the second mixer, have two frequencies, filter one of them out. So again, you get the same frequency back. But in this case, it go up in the second mixer and go down in the first mixer. And that breaks down reciprocity if the local oscillator phase of these two mixers are different. So uh, as an uh, experimental demonstration, uh, what he did is he basically take a device like that. First of all, uh, he's, going to mesh, he's going to measure the transmission from here to there, and from here to there, as he measure, as he varies the phase difference between the two mixers. And when you do that, you get a, a typical oscillation between the uh, forward and the backward direction. Uh, both of them oscillate as you vary the local oscillator phase. You see that the oscillation patterns are different. And that's a strong, that's a direct indication of non-reciprocity. And in particular, uh, there exists a particular choice of the non-reciprocal phase where you get complete contrast between the forward and the backward direction. This contrast is as large as 30 dB if you actually measure it. And moreover, it's completely tunable. If you fix the phase shifter in the reciprocal arm to be pi over 2, then essentially the contrast ratio is independent of frequency. It remains about 32 dB over the entire frequency range that we actually measure from 8 to 12 megahertz. So uh, what we show here is, at least in principle, these kind of ideas can work spectacularly well to give you very large contrast ratio in the forward and backward direction and over essentially infinite bandwidth if you have the right component. Now, once you have the gauge potential, you can uh, go one step beyond and say, well, can I generate an effective gauge field or effective magnetic field? And so, uh, and I think, again, uh, to do that, uh, it's useful, again, to review what a gauge field would do to an electron. So uh, imagine that you are in a tight binding model. So you have an electron hopping uh, in a square lattice. And then you apply a magnetic field that's perpendicular to this two-dimensional lattice. Now, the magnetic field enters in the following way. Uh, in a single plaquette, plaquette, if you imagine an electron goes around in a round trip, it's going to acquire a phase uh, that's uh, equal to the integral of the gauge potential along the edge. 
or equivalently uh, equal or proportional to the magnetic flux that pass through a single unit cell. And this phase, again, is non-reciprocal. If you revert the hopping direction, you're going to change the sign. So in this case, when you have a lattice model, the magnetic field basically manifests in terms of a non-reciprocal round-trip phase as the electron hops along a single unit cell. Now, what we do here is we can specify this phase for photonic system. So uh, to get an effective magnetic field for photon, uh, what we do is we imagine a lattice that looks like this that consists of two sub-lattices at different frequencies, omega a and omega b. And then we modulate the bond between these frequencies. And we specify the phase distribution on each individual bond. And if you specify them in just the right way, you'll be able to get exactly the same magnetic field effect as you get for electron. So uh, I should mention that related to our work, there has been a number of very interesting proposal, in particular one that came out of here uh, by Dr. Hafez Z, that published in Nature Physics a year ago, uh, with a closely related idea, but trying to do that for the photon spin degree of freedom. So what they got is a gauge field associated with the spin degree of freedom. Now, one very important distinction that what we do here Again, some of these spin-dependent effects is that in those systems, you don't break time reversal symmetry, whereas in our system, it's a time reversal symmetry broken system. That distinction is important. In electrons, there is a Kramer's degeneracy, and as a result, you can have topologically robust state even, in, uh, even if you don't break time reversal symmetry. Whereas in photon, there's no Kramer's degeneracy to protect those states. So as a result, even though you get the same kind of spin-dependent gauge field, it's actually difficult to create a robust state unless you truly bring time reversal symmetry. But in any case, so in our case, what you do is you specify a phase in each individual bound. Now, at least in principle, you can do that. You imagine, for example, two photonic crystal resonator and then you put in the intermediate resonator and you modulate the photonic transition at the intermediate resonator and the modulation phase here then translate into an effective coupling constant phase between these two resonators that are located at two different spatially separated points. So, uh, so in this case, by specifying the phase along each individual bound, you would then be able to get a all kinds of different effective magnetic field distribution. Um, as a simple example, if you specify all these phases to be equal, then you get a zero magnetic field. On the other hand, if you specify the modulation phase in this way, you get a uniform magnetic field. Uh, you get a uniform magnetic field uh, throughout this entire lattice. So, as a way to test some of these effects. Uh, what we do is we put these two lattices together and then you generate a wave packet. Now, inside the zero magnetic field region, a wave packet will go straight, so you basically have a propagation. Once it enters into the effective the region with the effective magnetic field, uh, as you see, it turns around. And that's basically what you expect of a charged particle going through a uh, charged particle uh, experiencing a Lorentz force. Uh, and it's indeed a Lorentz force. Uh, as you imagine, the effect of magnetic field here has to do with the specification of the phase. So if you change this phase here, you can change the effect of magnetic field. So uh, what we do here is we change this phase, and if we do that, the trajectory of the light for the same instant pulse is always circular inside the effect of magnetic field region, but the radius here become inversely proportional to the field strength that you specify. So you clearly see that you could do a Lorentz field, uh, do a Lorentz field uh, for photon in this, in this way. Um, the other very important effect for electron is the How large should the wave pack be? Sorry? How large should the wave pack be? Uh, about, uh, we did a, uh, about probably four or five lattice constants. 
you would uh, at that point see very little dispersion already. So another important effect uh, is something called quantum form. If you take a 2D electron gas, you apply a uh, perpendicular magnetic field, you can generate a one-way edge state on the edge of the sample. And, uh, uh, and that one-way edge state is immune to backward scattering because there are no uh, edge state in the other propagation direction. So uh, similarly, uh, in our photonic lattice, you can do almost exact analog of that quantum core effect. You take a resting lattice, you specify effective magnetic field, then you put a source on the edge. You oscillate that source. What you see is the generated electromagnetic energy actually go only to one direction. There's no field that going in the opposite direction. So what you see is a one-way propagation. And uh, this is robust if you perturb the edge, it simply goes around it without any reflection. So I guess this, uh, I'm essentially out of time, so let me summarize. Um, I want to make two points in this talk. Uh, one is that uh, it is actually, from a practical point of view, uh, it is actually possible to build modulator or use dynamic modulation to completely reproduce standard magneto optical effect. And what you get in this is a far better control of on-trip non-reciprocal optics for practical information processing applications. The second point I'd like to make is that a more basic one, it turns out that this dynamic modulation has to do with a gauge potential and a gauge field for photons. Uh, unlike the regular magnetic field, here you have a great degree of freedom in specifying the phase distribution and therefore specify the gauge field distribution. And that may give you a very interesting set of optical and electromagnetic effects. So with that, um, let me stop and thank you for your attention.